I've seen you live probably upwards of a hundred times. What? And, uh, oh yeah. They, nobody told me this. Nobody, nobody informed me. I was told there'd be no math. Um, <laughs> and you, Even you are a, a single number constitutes math. She made me think of hundreds. I can't believe you've seen me. I don't know if I've ever talked to someone that's seen me hundreds of times. Well, here's tell the me thing everything. about, let yeah. me tell you something about you before we even talk about you talking about you. You yeah. are so lovable and uh, delightful. This is the thing. You happen to be very funny, but immediately you come on stage within four seconds. Everyone's like, I really like him. Uh, I like him. He's so lovable. Nice. You are. It's funny that you say that because I did a show recently that wasn't great. It, I was opening for a musician and sometimes those are the the only shows when you when you start out in stand up, they're all bad. They're all struggles. Like nobody cares, <laughs> you know. Even the other comedians are mad that you're taking their slot, and the audience is sort of. It, it's not that they're mad; they're just sort of indifferent, you know. It, it's like who's this guy? Right. Um, although I will note that being like a tall man is a is a slight advantage. You know what I mean? Like at least they're like he looks like what I think it could be. So there is a privilege there. <laughs> and I want to check that privilege. So I had that going for me, but like for the most part, people were like, "Who's this idiot?" Right. And the only <laughs> time that I feel that way now, 20 years in, is if I'm opening for a musician because everyone's there to see the band and you're just in the way. And right. they might know who you are, but uh, it, it, mostly they don't. And, and you're just sort of, you're just <laughs> like you're a giant clock ticking down when the thing that they wanna see starts. And even the person that brought me up said, this guy's coming up. He's oh, just for a couple minutes, like he said, like just, <laughs> just a couple minutes. Don't worry, because they were so excited to see the musician. So the, I did that show, and I know you're interested in like a lot of the things I'm interested in, like performance and 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 how how do we how do we do our best? You know, that seems to be a shared interest of ours. And I didn't do my best that show. It was okay. Like if I was new, I would have been like, that was the best set I've ever had, but I, I wanted to do very well. <laughs> right. and, the, and the problem was, I didn't remember to communicate exactly what you're talking about, which is a mix of gratitude, like real gratitude, not fake, not acting grateful, yeah. but yeah. actually being like, oh my God. Like I didn't say anything like, thank you for that warm welcome. I immediately started <laughs> talking about how Oh, I know I'm not what you want. Like I, I came at it from the wrong frequency. And then like, I didn't do as well. So that that likability, yeah. I'd like to think is, is natural, but it's also a little bit studied and a little bit deliberate. Like I'm like, you it, like it would be a fair thing to say, like I have a show tonight going out on stage, like don't forget, uh, I might not say be likable, but I'd say be soft. Don't go out and be like, right. I know you guys want to <laughs> see like you have to be like, oh, what a privilege that I get to talk to all of you and right. you all listen. Like, what a joy! Like, so yeah, I, I that's fresh on my that's mind. That's so interesting. Tangent. That's so interesting. But there is a power in being nice and kind. And really, if I had to describe you in three words, definitely hysterical, but very kind and lovable. It's just who you are. But I, I, I love that you've now like kind of looked at that and seen like, but that's a strategy for life. Like, take take note like it actually yeah. changes the way you you experience and enjoy it yourself all right let's talk about this journey yeah. so yeah. um well, i want to know why and how you've seen me hundreds of times because did you live I, in new york at the same time as me or here? i've lived in la for 18 years and so um right now we're wow. in florida uh we came here oh, wow. during the pandemic uh but i would be at largo right now tonight seeing you oh, I, mean, I, wow. see, I saw you at ucb a zillion times and largo and mm -hmm. But we love you so much. I mean, oh, that's really sweet. I'm one of like millions of people who feels this way. But yes, I'm half I'm proud to be in this in this space. Um, <laughs> I, all right, that's so, very kind. So this show, um, I started because I was living in L.A. and so many people wanted to do the thing that they came there to do, but they couldn't figure out how to leave the dumb day job. You know, you get to L.A. and you came there to write scripts or to be a songwriter. And five years in, you're still a barista. And you're like, wait a minute. So next thing I know, Pete, the show has 30 million downloads and there's all these people in, in, in that same space, especially yeah. now during this like great resignation. I think people are like, oh, if, if death is even an option, like I do want to do what I love. So I want to talk about your journey of being this like really sweet kid who went to church and did all the right <laughs> things and then wound up being 
so successful doing something you really seem to like. How the heck did that happen? Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, like I watched Tick, Tick, Boom. Did you watch Tick, Tick, Boom? I just watched it. Did, did you not like it? No, it was, it was fine. Yeah, no, it was good. Uh, you know why I really liked it is why? it reminded me of what you're talking about is, yeah. is like that song that they sang about no more walking your laundry, uh, like through the snow and all that sort of stuff. And it looked like they shot it in my building, like that I lived in in Brooklyn right, with my right. friend Matt McCarthy. And it made me just so, uh, it, it tapped me back into exactly what I was missing at that musical show. Like since then, I've been having great shows because exactly what you just said, I was like, so here's the story of the guy, uh, of the man who wrote Rent. And then he died before he even saw it happen. Yeah, he had an aneurysm, uh, right? That was crazy. Yes. Like the night before or something, awful. Uh, ne us neurotic people didn't need to know that uh, sudden heart aneurysm is I a thing, but yeah. it is. <laughs> but you know what, to your point, it's actually good to know that that's a thing uh, because we shouldn't take anything for granted. And, and that and that's what I was doing. I, I noticed that when I did that show, I was taking for granted the fact that I'm a, a comedian that's welcome on a stage and gets to do comedy. So I don't find it morbid at all to sort of remember that this is temporary and all that sort of stuff because it it imbues the moment with with gratitude and yeah, yeah. and like an urgency too i think that's the whole point i i say this on my podcast all the time i go would ice cream taste good if you knew you lived forever i i i, I would say it wouldn't it wouldn't taste as good because yeah. you'd be like who cares i'll have more of this later because i am infinite um yeah anyway all that no to day say, but today let's all sing it together yes yes yeah, sure I mean, you could, oh, no, 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 now, but now there's no today. <laughs> well, that, that, I digress. Um, I'm not a kind of person that says, I digress. I regretted saying, I digress. Um, I I don't know where you'd like to start because it's it's a long story. So how did you get into, what was your first like sort of whisper of like, I'm going to do stand up? Like, and, and how, and how did you like actually allow yourself to go full into that when there was probably eight other things your parents would rather you do? Well, I sort of benefited from my parents. Um, my dad was very into, I, I say this with love, it's, it sounds like I'm sort of upset about it, but like he was very into <laughs> his own thing. Like my dad is a very driven person and he was doing his thing. He's still doing his thing. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't really like eagle-eyeing me. Like, what are you gonna do? What are you about? Like, Got it. Like I felt interest and love, like they wanted me to be happy, but I didn't have that like, all my friends were like, where are you gonna go to college? And I was like, I don't know, like nobody's brought it up. Like it just wasn't a thing. Um, what are you gonna do for money was never discussed. And then when I went to, I ended up going to a very small Christian college. And I don't mean like, uh, schools like Holy Cross are Christian colleges. Harvard was founded as a Christian college. But I mean, this is like really, like you have to sign a thing that says you believe in Jesus and, and all these, like it's it's a religious college. Yeah. So I went there because I thought I was gonna be a, a youth pastor because I look like this. And um, I ended up <laughs> in, the, in the bubble of safety. I actually look at my time, at, it's called Gordon College very fondly because it was, it was like 1600 kids, small school. And it was like slow pitch softball or something. It was just like a safe place. If you wanted to like try improv, which is what I did. I had been doing improv in high school, but continue doing improv. Everybody was just so nice. Like it, it's like the good side of, of being in a spiritual yeah. community is yeah. there's people tend to be kind. Yeah. So they were like supportive. So I had this big like bubble of like, they didn't want you to swear, but I didn't really want to swear. I didn't want to be dirty. So it, was, it worked out. And then like, it was my freshman year, I started writing for the paper and I realized that those essays were sort of like stand up, and I was doing improv and I realized I liked that. That made me come alive more than anything. Um, and that's still true. I did a set last night and, and when I do stand up, I, I just have to concede this as much as I like being a spiritual person and, and being like, you can't look out there for your fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. I also have to fly at a different altitude and go like, but it's also true that when I do that, I, I just I just feel at home in my body and on the planet. So that, that was true then too. So I, I was smart enough or lucky enough to recognize that, that I was like, 
because you know people would tell you like creative people they'd be like maybe marketing you know maybe advertising these these were the things that people would tell me and then when I did comedy I was like I don't you know I don't want to write jingles for toothpaste nothing wrong with that I just want to do this mm -hmm. so as soon as it, it's a little bit overly romantic or simplified to say but as soon as I sort of got a taste for comedy and started reading up on people like Seinfeld and Conan and Chris Farley and you know, uh, Ellen DeGeneres, these were people that I looked to because they were sort of like, like wholesome and, and kind of nice seeming people, Ray Romano, looking to see what they did. It just seemed like they just did it. And that, and that's what I would tell standups is like, if you want to be a standup, don't listen to me, just go, go do it and do it as much as you can. Yeah. Because I said this recently in an interview where I was like, the advice I would even give someone isn't applicable anymore. It's like I was running across a rope bridge and it was on fire behind me. And that's not to discourage you. It's just, you can't go over the exact same bridge as me, but you can follow similar ideas and principles. But um, so the, the, the short answer is as soon as I realized how good it felt to do comedy, not to be weird, but how, uh, that I was good at it. I, I, I'm just gonna jump to, I think it's one of my best pieces of advice is I say, follow <laughs> the dream that's also following you. This seems like the kind of podcast you would say that, that you would like that. Meaning we live in a culture currently, <laughs> we live in a culture currently that values comedy, entertainment, movie stars, TV stars, you know, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of people like sort of force their dream in that direction. They'll go like, well, maybe I'll be the next, uh, you know, whoever. Right. Right. Um, I'll be the next Billie Eilish. I'm trying to think of somebody young. Um, but Billie Eilish is, a, is you know, she, she's very good. You know, she, she had to learn how to become very good, but that was like in her bones to do music. And what I'm, so what I say when I say, follow the dream that's also following you is you get feedback. That doesn't mean you're not bad. It means you're better than the other bad people. Or at least, you know, you have the potential to be better than the other bad people. Meaning you go to an open mic and you are bad and you're sort of bad for 10 years. You're, you're not great for a long time, wow. but you, you see improvement. And I, I don't mean to make it about comparison, but you're like, I think I'm doing better than average. And that's the feedback of this dream is also wanting me. Meaning don't get, don't get confused that you're like, okay, I have this one life. I, like you said, I, death is on the table. I wanna do something great. Well, what are the chances that your great thing is also what culture values? Maybe what your great thing is, isn't valued by the culture, isn't rewarded with billions of dollars or whatever it might be and, and fame, but it's your happiest, sweetest, most natural yeah. in the flow spot. Follow that. Um, I was just very lucky that what I actually liked doing and wanted to do that one I was very fortunate that I was good at and two that I'm fortunate that I live in a world where it's valued if, if this was the turn of the century you wouldn't be interviewing me you'd be talking to a steel worker you know what I mean you'd be talking to a prospector like there would be no value in me I'm so glad I'm alive in 2022 where people are like tell me more about your your diarrhea routine you know what I mean like this is insane <laughs> I'm so glad you're alive in 2022 and I it, I like it like brought tears to my eyes because this is I, I knew there was some religiosity to your past um but just hearing that you had at one point intention to want to be you know a pastor a youth pastor it, it makes sense because when you walk on stage there's just a palpable amount of goodness it, there's just a goodness and I it literally like, like brings tears to my eyes because um it's a busy world and that's a very rare it's just to be to be genuine is uh it's it's generous and it's it, it takes it takes vulnerability and kindness so i appreciate it i guess my question is like you're in this sea right of hollywood and i have seen you so many times and you are so yourself how do you regardless of whatever relationship you now have with your religion or how you feel, because gosh, that's a whole journey in of itself. But just given who you are, how, do, how, how have you stayed true to what really feels like your genuine sweet self in a, in a world of, of things that sometimes um, take people out of that alignment, make people have a little bit 
more of a cynical like bent on on the world? Well, it's a generous and good question. I appreciate it. I I actually think that uh, for me, and I've seen this like you're sort of alluding to. I've seen this go the other way. Um, for me. I say this so often, I really should pay Jim Carrey money or something. I do by watching all of his stuff, I guess. <laughs> but he says, I wish everybody could have their dreams come true so they could see it's not the answer. Have you seen that, heard that quote? No, but um, that's so- I wish beautiful. everybody could become like rich and famous so they could see it's not the answer. Um, and I'm very fortunate that I have so many wonderful spiritual mentors, um, I mean, you're right, it's like a nine hour conversation, but Rupert Spira is right here on my desk, uh, Richard Rohr, Rob Bell, Ram Dass, who was in my dream last night. I tried to tell him a joke and he, he didn't seem to like it. <laughs> what <is awesome> <laughs> he, it wasn't that he didn't like it, he just seemed to be distracted by something else, but we were holding hands, which was really sweet. Yes. I miss him. Beat home, um, had a dream so anyway, telling yeah, Ram Dass a joke. That's the best story I've ever been told. Amazing. Okay, keep going. I know. I know. Well, I, I only got the setup and then he sort of turned away. But anyway, <laughs> um, because of this and because of Valerie, my wife, who, who's similarly inclined, which is the greatest joy of my life, is that when we got together, we were both sort of ex-evangelical people. Um, and the, the fact that we both found Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie and Alan okay. Watts and all these things and both liked it you know what I mean, um, is incredible. It's, it's the greatest joy. Um, it would have been okay if she didn't like it, but the fact that she does like it and has her own yeah. path with Tara Brock and Jack Kornfeld, I'm just saying all these names now. But anyway, the, the, point, the, the short answer, I'll try and keep it short is, <laughs> because of that, I was ready to, or I wasn't surprised when my dreams came true and you still, um, and it's not the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying it doesn't. Um, there's psychological uh, joy, and there's fleeting joy. Mean, meaning, that, I'm not saying it's not joyful, but it, it's not a. It's not a. It's not the peace that passes all understanding. Let's just say that to to quote uh, JC. Uh, I call him JC. That is, I said I digress, <laughs> and I call him JC. This is this interview is going very poorly. Uh, but anyway. I love the when, color commentary because, on your own self. It's the best. I know. I can't stop it. I can't <laughs> stop it. But anyway, be, because of because of this steady diet, it's like comedy is probably, uh, you know, it sounds weird to break it into percentages, but it, it, it's it's only a percentage of my day. Show business and it, it, and I'd I'd put it in like twenty. Wow. Twenty percent of my day, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Not even every day. But every day is uh, spiritual things. I, it sounds yeah. so stupid to say spiritual things. No, I mean meditation, contemplation. Yeah, uh, and and for me, I, I'm a big yana yoga, yoga of the intellect. Meaning, I like to read ideas, and ideas sort of break my brain, and then and then can set me free in that way. So anyway, because of that, when I encountered the 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 hollowness or the or the the desperateness yeah. of show business, which is definitely there. It sort of feeds into some of your worst uh, or maybe just more base desires. Like, do you like me? Do you yeah. want me? Am yeah. I special? Yeah. Am I invited to the party? Am I behind the rope? Do you know who I am? Am I important? So looking for your value out there. Um, when that disappointed me, I had I fell back into a huge uh, library of people that were like, yeah, this is what we told you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so it wasn't a surprise. In fact, speaking around us, these are people that say that suffering is a clue. It's not a bad thing. It's actually, uh, it's a, it means your instrument is working properly. When I have my heart broken by show business and I go, let's say I meet a very, very famous person who I admire and they seem empty. I, like, I hate to judge, but they just seem hollow and they don't seem to like their kids or they they hate right. their wife or whatever it is and it it haunts me for months and then i i go that is a a clue that's actually grace that's that's something saying 
stop going to the hardware store for milk. So I go to show business for show business. Uh, I sometimes get caught up in it and I, I catch myself going to it for love and for my value and I get burned and that'll keep happening. That's the pitfall of it. But for the, for the most part I've learned, now I can't even say for the most part, I'm still learning to go, don't go to show business for, for love. That, that like this new show I did, um, I'm not trying to work it in to promote it. No, but it's, we're, I was we're shooting, going there anyway, I can't wait. How We Roll. It, yeah, it premieres March 31st. I really hope people like it, it's on CBS. Anyway, I was talking to Rob Bell about it, who's, who's again, the spiritual teacher. And we were, he was like, Pete, there's nothing, don't look for anything more than going and shooting your show. And, and on a rehearsal day would be done at like two o'clock. And then I'd go and pick my daughter up. He's like, don't wait for the premiere. Don't wait right. for an award right. or a big rating. He's like, that's it. Being with friends and shooting a fun show yeah. and then still going to pick up my baby. That's it. That's, 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 all we, that's all we could ask for. Because that, that's what is that? That's relationship. That's human beings being together. That's not... I'm not waiting for like, yeah, but if I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone, which is the first 10 years of my career, I was going like when I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone. And now I know so many people that have been on the cover of Rolling Stone and I can see, baby, it's not the answer. Don't, don't go to the hardware store for milk. Oh my gosh, this last stretch of what you said, we should all <laughs> listen to it every day, honestly, every single day. And so many of those people have been on this show, but <laughs> Byron Katie. I'm Deepak Chopra yeah. was just here last week and he said, he gave me such a gift. He was like, for all of the listeners. That. Yeah. And he was saying like, you know, you can say, I am Pete Holmes. You can say, I am Kathy Heller. I am Walt Disney. Say it. He's like, but then just say, I am. And that's really you. It's the, I am right. It's that space. And so, um, yeah, we, we all have these yeah. egos that buy into this illusion that they, they need to be bigger and there's like this separateness and this like scarcity and this ego needs more power to be bigger than and then when we go back to who we really are it's like I, i'm hearing you say all this and it's like music and i'm 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 not surprised at all that your career mm. is uh such a delight for all of us and i'm not surprised that there's continuously new projects because you're so in the river. Like you're just witness to that you're so people want to do business with people they really like to be with and you're actually present so people can be with you and you're not grasping. I mean, I've done, like I said, 600 of these shows. It's very rare that people who are in your position wow. like really get this. And what a gift for your, what a gift for, for you as a dad to pass this forward, right? I mean, it's pretty cool. Well, you're, you're so kind. I, this is such a great way to start my day. Not only hearing you say such nice things, but also to remember these things myself. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's what your good questions did. So so Deepak loves Rupert. This is this is Rupert Spira. He, this is this is a poem actually called a meditation on I am. So this is exactly I have what to you're get talking my about. Hands on it. So he loves Rupert. I I would recommend there's a book called um, Being Aware of Being Aware, which is my favorite of Rupert's books. Um, but it's about exactly what you're talking down. about. But you know, it's interesting. Yeah, what's I, I find there's value in, and I think Deepak and Rupert, I don't know, might agree with me. There's just different altitudes to, to our life. Like it's one life, it's one thing, but we can fly at different altitudes. And I, I find there's value for me to separate them. Meaning we're talking about, there's this great, I'm paraphrasing it, but there's a roomy poem where it's like, you're in an apple orchard just eat some apples, don't, don't waste the day wondering who planted the trees or whatever. Meaning there's a time to just go like, I'm just talking to you. I know we're all one, but isn't it fun to play this game? And why did, why did, why did the oneness split if it didn't want to play this, play this game? It, yeah. it wanted to do this. Yeah. My daughter's name is Leela. Leela means the dancer, the play of the universe. So let's play, let's dance. You know what I mean? It doesn't all have to be, but it's not real or, or nothing's really happening or whatever. So what we're talking about is like finding fulfillment or, or kind of filling out the suit of, of being a comedian and, and how that felt right to me. My favorite altitude to fly at is, is what you're talking about, 
which is what Deepak and Rupert Spira love to talk about, which is like, when you can, I, I haven't always been called Pete, meaning when I was a baby, I didn't know I was Pete, but I was, you know, I, I existed. Uh, I, I haven't always lived in Boston and I live in Los Angeles now, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but I can't say I'm a Los Angelino because I haven't always, so what Rupert would say is, so that means those things aren't essential to me. My name, where I'm from, yep. what I do, th those things aren't essential to us. So the, the process of self-inquiry, when you close your eyes and you say, who or what is aware of my experience? I was just doing it last night. I do, I do it as I fall asleep often where I'm just sort of like, there's no limit. When you close your eyes, you can do it right now. There's no boundary. There's no boundary yeah. to this awareness. Yeah, it's infinite. Like Rupert would say, can you find a boundary on the other side of which this awareness is not? And of course you can't. It's one of the reasons why the universe feels so sort of familiar. We're floating in this infinite blackness, but we are infinite blackness. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. it's like an as above, so below sort of thing. Totally. And we're sort of like, okay, but you realize that you're the, you are this, you're the, you're the whole thing. You're So what I love about Rupert is he says that that awareness, that knowing is made of peace and is made of happiness because mm. it's desireless and that's your real self. So I'll tell you, even though I've had my, my tea and I'm very happy to be talking with you right now, you know, I think it, my daughter woke up at like six this morning and my, my wife got up with her and I, I got to sleep because I have a show tonight and I, I needed the extra rest or whatever, but I couldn't fall back asleep and I was just having that anxiety. Like you're just having like sort of like an un, unfounded, reasonless anxiety. So what I I wanna say, when you remember that who you are is peace, that doesn't, I know that. And yet I still have these like bouts, like it'll wash over me just like a like dread or, or panic. And that's when it's helpful to go, who or what is noticing this panic uh -huh. right now? Uh -huh. and, and, and with practice, it gets easier to sink into that. And that's what being aware of being aware is about. That book oh, will describe it much better than I can. I knew, I said to you, I knew this was going to be fun because I said it nine times. You're so likable and sweet, but like, I didn't know that we were going to have this whole conversation. And we've got all these people on who are like, you know, Marianne Williamson and Gary Zukoff and all these people. And you're a guy who I've seen on stage making everyone laugh. And I mean it like, and you don't need me to say this. I just want to name it for the audience. I am like equally as like moved as I am talking to those people. And I love that you said like your life can play in many altitudes because I'd say. I, I don't even get it. Like, I feel like, is there a part of you that ever says to yourself, wait, aren't I then, since I kind of get all this, aren't I supposed to just like write books about this and write plays about this only? Or is there a part of you that goes, no, this other dimension, it really serves. Like it makes people laugh and, and therefore that's okay that it's not, I don't know, that this part of my life isn't Eckhart Tolle, but it's like, it's doing something else. Like, how do you ra rationalize that? Cause I, a lot of people listen yeah. to the show, they feel like they should have a calling and that they need to always be in that purpose driven thing. Whereas there might be some benefit. Like I've never even considered, like if I was as good as you are at that other thing and I got this stuff, like how would you know where to spend that focus or time? Mm. Again, it's a great question. I, I did write a book about uh, called Comedy, Sex, God, because those are the three things it's about. Um, yeah. About my that. journey two, from evangelical. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Two, three years ago. I, whoa, I can't believe that's true. <laughs> it feels <laughs> like I just finished it. It feels like I just turned it in. Anyway, yes. Um, but really, that's that's less interesting because that sounds like I'm like, but I, but I do. It's like defensive. I actually think the better and truer answer is, you know what I mean? You catch yourself being yeah. sort of like, I do, I do that stuff. <laughs> and certainly my podcast, uh, but that, that's, not, that's not the interesting answer. I think it's so dumb to limit uh, ultimate truth or ultimate reality 
to just writing books about ultimate truth, ultimate reality, right? I mean, I like reading books called Being Aware of Being Aware, yeah. but uh, most people don't. I don't know if you've noticed, like yeah. even Deepak Chopra, who's huge, <laughs> most people don't read Deepak Chopra. Like, like find, and he's huge, that's my point. But a lot of people like comedy. That's not to say more people read Deepak Chopra than listen to my comedy, that's for sure. But I, I'm i like these people like that, or, or let's say I've been like these people that don't necessarily want to read a spiritual book, but could st we still recognize truth and something helpful when we hear it. Yeah. So I do think there's a great value. If you watched a, a stand-up special of mine with me, I could pause it after every bit and tell you the spiritual principle that I think is behind almost every I joke. There's some jokes that it's just for its own sake, for sure. Okay. And by the way, none of this, Kathy, is on purpose. I don't start with, yeah. you know, no. love your love your enemy and like try to write a joke. It's just if all you're doing, by my own math, 80% of the day is reading and studying and meditate, all that stuff. When I write a joke, it's going to be in there. So the the one that I that sometimes I do do jokes directly about um, God or the meaning of life or whatever you want to call it, and those are some of my favorite jokes. But oftentimes I'll just do a, I have a joke about traffic and about how people use ways to get around traffic, and the joke is about non resistance. Like it sounds like I'm just making fun of ways. But really, I'm making fun of the human mind that can't, that that would rather careen through a gated community and run over a skateboard and do a U-turn in a cul-de-sac to save five minutes because that's how unpleasant it is to yes. be with yourself. Yes. Like, yes. really? Yeah. And in that joke, I say, why, why not just surrender and remain? Yeah. which by the way, is a powerful teaching. But that's what I did when I had the panic, surrender. Hey, panic, come on in. You can't hurt the real me, come on in. Yeah. And you're welcome here. And you know what panic, get as big as you want. And by, uh, by the way, this is a paradox. As soon as you say, get as big as you want, it goes away because all it wanted, like all of us, the feeling wants what we want, it wants to be acknowledged, wants to be seen and then it can go on its way. Oh, it's so so there's a joke about ways that I think is actually about non-resistance. <laughs> that's so that's so beautiful. And it reminds me, uh, Jenna Fisher and Brian Baumgartner and Rain Wilson have all been here and we've all talked about The Office and how the last line of The Office is Jenna's character, Pam, she's saying, well, I guess there's beauty in ordinary things. Isn't that really the point? Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, that show, like, you know, it just touched so many lives, right? And it it had no intention of taking people to church, but it did mm -hmm. because it really like mm -hmm. met people on a level of like, oh, you see how in the ordinary you could you could be be something to someone else. You could matter, right? You could be visible in a that's way. Right. You, right. So that that's really what you just said. And that's so beautiful. So I want to ask you one of the biggest questions that comes up for this audience. And now that we're talking about all this stuff with ego and the true self with a capital S, I feel like this is a good question to ask you of all people, but we've had millions of listeners and people sending in notes. And, and the biggest thing comes down to a feeling of uh, unworthiness or I'm not enough. So there's like a courage issue, right? Uh, where the resistance of this ego comes up and people will write in and say, yeah, but like, if I do stand up, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not good at it and I can't overcome that feeling, or I'm afraid to start a podcast because nobody will listen. And there's this like a, a tremendous amount of resistance in the fear of it not being good or people not liking it. And so you said before, like, you're going to be, I loved how you named that. You're like, no, you're probably not going to be good at it for like oh, 10 years. I think you said, but you maybe you'll be a little better than yeah. the other people, but there is a courage in making mediocre things that requires that the ego takes a little bit of a surrender. But when you're so attached yeah. to needing to make things that people like, there's no creative process. There's, there's no grace to allow yourself 
to, to show up. And the ego then becomes so loud and people go, you don't understand the amount of fright that I have to get on stage or to show someone my screenplay, forget it. It's like, was that really about you or your ego? No, that's my humility. And I'm like, is that your humility or your arrogance? Like, who is that really about your ego or yourself? How do you help people if they have a gift and they have a desire to contribute, but they're so scared of it not being good enough or what people will say, how can they push through that so that they actually yeah. give themselves a chance to show up for the assignment of being themselves and not yeah. bow down to some feeling of imposter syndrome? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a lo- it's a big question because it's tempting to, to just give the go for it answer. And then, it, uh, and I think that that's where I'm leaning. I'm leaning more towards the go for it, the self-love and, and, the, and the take a chance for sure. But before we get to that, which is the better part, we'll start with the more boring part, which, which is going back to what we're saying, which is the why. If someone's like, I don't want you to read my screenplay. It's like, well, why do you want to write screenplays? <laughs> is it because if you asked a thousand people what like the lottery ticket, easy way to a better life, creative like pursuit would be is write a movie. Is it because of JK Rowling? You know what I mean? Are you, are you imitating someone else's dream or is it your dream? Are you Zach Braff writing Garden State? Do you fucking love movies? Do you love them or do you hate your life? Uh, and, and that's like, either is fine. But if you hate your life, there's other ways to fix your life than becoming a screenwriter. And they're more immediate and they're more realistic. So wow. that's sort of the, the hard nosed, but I, I think everybody needs to have a why. My why, why am I a comedian? Is because it feels unbearable to not be a comedian. That, that's, that's a great answer for me is like, it's, it's my, home place that doesn't mean it's not horrible sometimes and that for like I said 10 years it was a real struggle but I I didn't I didn't have that like what am I even doing like I didn't have that because I was like my whole life I was making silly videos with my friends my whole life I was obsessed with Weird Al and Sinbad and Seinfeld like I just I loved comedy. So like, are you doing what you love or are you doing what our culture tells you would make you important? That's a really, really important question. So if somebody is dragging their feet and saying like, I wanna do a podcast, but I'm embarrassed to have people listen to it. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't have the compulsion required for this. I have the look at me. You need a little look at me. Kathy, you have look at me. We're the kids on the diving board saying, watch me dive. Mm-hmm. And that's in our psychology. It's, on our, it's in our makeup and it serves our job. If you don't have that, like Valerie, my wife, she, she recorded several episodes of a podcast and she never released it. And she is my favorite person. She is brilliant. She is a genius. She is talented and she's a gift to the world. And a podcast of her own was not right. And she listened to that and she didn't do it. And that is okay. That wasn't like a failure, but she recognized that she didn't have that like, look at me compulsion. Whereas when I started my podcast, I couldn't wait to upload more episodes because I couldn't wait to see what people would think. I had that that need. So my first answer and the, the more bummer answer is, why do you want those things? You need like, really, like we need like a hard nose. Why do you want those things? Yep. And, and if it's because you want to be rich and famous, what are you going to do after you're rich and famous? Because my answer is I would keep doing a podcast and I would keep doing stand up because it wasn't about getting rich and famous. It was because I liked and needed to do those things. Yeah. So we need like a really clean why, a yeah. good answer, a, a mission statement. And and a respect for the information you're getting from your body and from your mind and from the world, right? Yeah. So if you have that why, and you know you do wanna make music or you do wanna uh, make movies or, or, or write scripts or whatever it might be, and you're still struggling, 
with, uh, and by the way, don't forget, you can still be bad. I'm not saying, <laughs> you, I just want you to know that your intent, your intent is pure. It's like getting a unicorn to approach you. They only approach the pure of heart. It's the same with a dream. <laughs> like you wanna get like a skittish unicorn to come and eat from your hand. And it's only gonna come to you if you're pure of heart. Like those myths exist for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So if you're pure of heart, as pure as you can be, and you're still plagued with like self-doubt and stuff, I think that self-doubt is probably part of why you're talented is because you're a discerning person. Mm -hmm. If you have too much belief in yourself, you'll make a bunch of garbage and you won't edit it and right. you'll think it's amazing and you'll stink. <laughs> and everyone will, all of your friends, I don't give my scripts to my friends to read because I'm embarrassed until it's great. I'm embarrassed. Like I want to get it right. I, I, I don't invite my friends to come and watch me do stand up because I'm embarrassed because I want it to be good yeah. and then get, but there are, there are some people I know they've never done something in their life. They write the first draft of their script and they want to have a reading. They get like 15 friends to like read it and put it on its feet and stuff. And I'm like, it really is a bell curve. You want to be, uh, discerning enough to like keep your work and, and your and your craft in a sweet spot of good. Yeah. But you don't want to be so self-loving that you're just like everything I make is great, but you don't want to be so self-critical that you think everything I make stinks. Yeah. yeah. That makes So to get back sense. really to the question, I think, is like if you don't think you deserve to make, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like when I wanted to do a podcast, believe it or not, this is 10 years ago, I remember people were like, well, there's so many other podcasts. Why, why, why would you make a podcast? Right. Why would anyone care if you have a podcast? Right. And my answer in my heart was because it's mine. It'll be my podcast. It'll be mm -hmm. different because it's my podcast. It's different because it's your podcast. So that's a good example of like, that like sort of Lizzo energy, like, fuck you. It'll be good because I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it. You have to have that. So yep. like, this is the part, this is the more fun part where it's like, if you don't think you're good at stand up or, or shouldn't try it, go to an open mic and watch the 15 other train wrecks that are, that are brave enough to do it. Don't judge them, but just see that you can at least do that badly. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Like when people want to try stand up, I say, just, just go to an open mic and watch and know that it doesn't have to be amazing to start. And, and the same with any pursuit, it's, it's okay to stink and you need to get over that critical, that self-critical fear. Yep. Um, and and I, I would take some time unpacking, like, what are you afraid of? People don't like it. I mean, people don't like a lot of things. At least you're trying to, you're trying to move in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And, um you you were talking about making work that's actually good and some people you know are not discerning it's very rare that anybody has one tv show that they star in uh that's good let alone like several <laughs> um you're you're so you're you're batting a thousand i mean i don't get it but it's it's happening lightning strikes several times with you so how did this new show come about and how are you able to make something like that actually several times like gets to network like that doesn't happen that is a unicorn eating out of your hand and you do it over yeah. and over again um so tell us a little bit about the show how we roll and then i love the premise that this is about a guy who decides to become a professional bowler as a means to provide for his family because that happens every day yeah. um what what makes the magic happen in this show? Why does this show have some magic sauce in it? Um, why are you excited to make it? And why do you think it landed with with the network? They said, look, let's let's make this. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the network thought, but I the difference between making How We Roll and Crashing is the difference between making what's known as a single camera comedy, which is like The Office, although I have the feeling that they had very good community on that show. Yeah. But on crashing, like I, I was shooting with different people every day. You know, it's it's like uh, sometimes you'd meet your scene partner ten minutes before you were shooting the scene. And with how we roll, 
these were people that I spent six months with every day. So your, your TV wife, Katie Lowe's, starts to feel like your real wife, like in the TV land, because you have inside jokes and, and you have all this time together. You eat lunch together. You, you spend all these, all these di- days laughing together. And that was a new experience for me to really feel like a summer camp or like a, or like a, yeah, summer camp is really the best way to put it is like, we were together laughing every single day and then they'd call action. So that stuff sort of bleeds into it. At least that's my hope. Yeah. So fun. And what do you, what do you want the viewers to sort of walk away with? Like, what do you feel like is the undercurrent, the some of the the message like in this show like what are you hoping is 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 sort of communicated well honestly it's some of what we've been talking about it's a it's a story of a guy who doesn't know if he should go for his dream and what i loved about the pilot was it wasn't him going i'm gonna go for it damn it it was his wife and his friends and as I can be sort of like a lone wolfy kind of person from time to time when it comes to my career. I, I like to do things alone. I don't have a writing partner. As I, as I was saying, I don't, I don't even like inviting people to my stuff. I just kind of want to separate my life and, and my work as much as I can. But this story is, is, was close to my heart because it's like, yeah, that'll only get you so far. At a certain point, you're going to need love, you're going to need support, and you're going to need friends. And the, the crashing was about becoming taking a chance and becoming a comedian. What I related to in this story was it's it's a family s- sort of pushing a guy, supporting him to to take that risk and then the ramifications of that. But you know, during the pandemic, I was watching so many multicam comedies uh, talk about flying at different altitudes. Sometimes you just want to laugh. Sometimes you know what I mean. Like it's yeah, not all Rupert Spira of all course. day every day. Yeah. Sometimes you just throw on Frasier or whatever it might be. Yeah. So it was really, what I didn't know, those shows are fun to watch, but they're even more fun to make. So I really enjoyed doing it. Oh, I'm so happy for you that you just shared how fun that is. I love that you, because you're such a nice person. I love that you're getting to do something that feels so fun. And let's just go back to crashing for a second. Um, It had so many layers to it, which is so cool, right? There was like, obviously stuff that made everyone laugh, but there was like serious parts of it too. I'm just curious for you and your experience of it, is there anything that surprised you about the experience of making that show? Was there anything that you came out with at the, at the end that you were surprised that you learned or that you got from the experience? Well, t- there's a lot of different altitudes I could answer that question at. It's, it's a big part of my book is the second season of Crashing. I was really uh, depressed and it was because of what we were talking about earlier. Um, that that Jim Carrey quote of there yeah. I was not just a first season like a lot of times you might get a first season of a show but it doesn't almost feel legitimate until you get that second season like you at least you tell yourself that you're like yeah but now we're a show do we get to keep being a show like or was it a mistake are they like whoops and, and you know so you want that second season and then we did get the second season and then we were shooting it and the way I describe it in the book was there was just a malaise. I just felt like I was wearing that lead uh, jacket they give you at the dentist. Like yeah. I felt heavy. Um, the cameras on set felt like prying. They didn't feel like, oh, there's your audience. It felt like invasive. Um, I, I just didn't have any balance. And that was when I, and, and again, I tell the story in the book, but I, I was really low, Val was out of town. I was smoking too much pot. I was still drinking at the time. I, I've since stopped those things. But like all these things that the world tells you are supposed to work, meaning you have your own show in New York City. Uh, oh, yeah. you're, on the weekends, you're getting stoned. You're drinking uh, fine wine or whatever it might be. Like I thought that was supposed to be it. And that was the biggest surprise. And that was, we're back to the, the grace of suffering. Is it, 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 was, it wasn't bad that I was suffering. It was like a warning light on the dashboard. It was like a, you've forgotten. Because it, by that point, I had already found these spiritual teachers that had changed my life. But then I got so caught up in show business 
that I put all of that aside. I stopped watering it. I stopped pruning it. I stopped yeah. giving it sunlight and it, and it sort of withered and died. But luckily I heard a voice that said, I seem to remember you like Ram Dass. And I, I hit play on this like 12 hour lecture of his. It's, it's not continuous, but it's 12 parts. And the part that I happened to unpause, that was in the middle of it. He was talking exactly about that, about how when you feel a malaise, it's a, it's a, a sign that something isn't working. And it's usually because you're looking for it out there. And, and, th and this w will always momentarily, so this is a Rupert Spira thing. When we get what we want, we do experience joy, but it's usually this, this very fleeting feeling because you're in that brief moment, you're experiencing desirelessness because you have what you want and you haven't had a moment to think of what you want next. You're just clean, you're clear. And, and that feeling of clearness is similar to the feeling that we were playing with earlier. It's the feeling of just spacious awareness. Like you lose your identity in the bliss of getting what you want. But here I was getting what I want, that bliss had faded away and now I'm just chasing it. I'm like, yeah, I have a show, but are, are we gonna get an award? Or like, do people care? Like, is it good or whatever right, it is? Right. And I had, to, I had to check back in and I'm so glad that I did. So that, that is the, that's the high altitude answer. Oh my There's gosh. other answers, but that's what the high an altitude answer. What an incredible answer. And uh, that makes so much sense. And again, so generous of you to be vulnerable and share behind the scenes of that. Uh, I took a couple of years of classes at the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center because it's so cool and it's right there. And they they showed us this study of how when wow. people attach their happiness to outcomes, like the day after someone wins an Oscar, they typically feel depressed, right? It's exactly what you're saying. And then there's this yeah. like surprise, like, why yeah. am I depressed? This is what I wanted. Um, but it it's because nothing is going to ever make you happy because you decide an achievement will do it. Like it's, it's never going to be attached to that joy yeah. will be attached to that. And I've had many friends, you know, through now doing this podcast who are best-selling authors and they'll, they'll reach the New York times list and they'll be like, I'm exhausted. And I, I'm now upset that I'm not number one on the list. I'm number four. It's like, what? Like it's awful. And recently yeah. I deleted Instagram from my phone because I just felt this addiction, like to this constant hit of, of this pull. Yeah. Um, and so it's really generous of you, you to share that. And I, I love that you came back to TV because my friend Kate was saying the other day that zero, you know, to a hundred thinking is it's black and white. It's like a trauma response, like to say, oh, then I'm never doing it again. It's like, well, is there a way to integrate what you just learned? And that's so cool. <laughs> you just shared this new experience and it's not that other experience. You're like, it's really delightful. And then I go and pick up my daughter. So yay, right. yay for you. That's such and a gift. I did because of going back to those things that I needed, um, Ram Dass and, and Eckhart Tolle and all that sort of stuff. I was able to rescue. I wasn't sad the whole second season. It, right, it right. sort of brought balance back. And then the third season, I was very happy because the third, I mean, that's, I had never had a stronger spiritual practice than the third season of crashing because I saw what happened when I neglected it. So that was like, but my baby wasn't born yet. I also have a three-year-old. So I would get up in the morning. I, I don't want to spiritually brag. I was meditating for a long time every morning. Cause I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I can't, I can't, I, I don't mind playing the game of like the specialness game or the shiny object game or whatever it might be. That's sort of part of what's happening here but we have to drop anchor into that, into that sense of self, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, again, this is Rupert. That's the only thing that never changes. So yeah. it's the only thing that's really worth uh, going like, wait, what is that? What is the consistent element of your experience? It's the knowing, it's the knowing that knows your experience. It's the same when you were two, when you were 12, when you were 22, yeah. when you were 32, whatever yeah. it is. So lose your fascination with the passing show that's happening, this is Rupert's analogy, on the screen of the movie and start wondering about the screen. What is what is the thing that supports oh all of God. existence? Yeah. So it's not the clouds, it's the sky, right? Um, that's right. Okay, 
last two questions. One's a follow-up to that. And then we're going to talk about your podcast and then we're going to go. So okay. my follow-up question is I've heard so many people now, right? No big surprise that the biggest through line in everyone who's been on this show is that they have some form of a meditation practice. It just like, ta-da, turns out that's what they do when they wake up or before they go to bed. And so I also, right, have that practice, have had that for the last like 12 years. And I heard young Pueblo, he was on the show, Diego Perez. And he's like, people are like, how do you have 2 million followers on Instagram or whatever, a best-selling book? And he says, I don't meditate to be successful, but because I meditate, I am. He's like, and I'm not sure exactly because I'm, I'm not meditating to be successful. But the reason I bring this up to you is because what I have found is, I think this is a Wayne Dyer quote, which is we don't get what we want. We get what we are. We don't manifest what we desire. We mm. manifest what we are, right? It's just mm. a matching vibration. And so it's interesting how we live in the society of like, do, 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 do. And then there's all these beautifully integrated, successful, creative people coming on saying how much time they spend in stillness. And yet all of this beautiful stuff seems to like be drawn toward them. So for people who are starting to hear that pattern, what's one tiny step maybe you could guide people to try? Because I think meditation, uh, just like you said about the traffic piece, which is true, sitting in traffic, it's very scary to be still. What's one mm. little thing maybe um, that you could just give as advice for someone who would like to start with three minutes every day and and how to do that in a gentle way where then we don't go, oh God, I'm really bad at this and now I'm more anxious because I think that's the initial experience. Yeah, I well, I've, I've that's great. I've heard it explained as as you're not supposed to be good at meditation. That's almost the point. Is it's a practice of self acceptance uh, and surrender. So yeah. there are. I know people say there are no bad meditations. It's sort of like a cliche or a you know right. at this point, but it's true. Um, my ego. I, I'm an achiever. I'm a performer. I want my meditations, or I used to really want them to all be like blissful, right? And, yeah, and of course. I wanted to have visions and I wanted to levitate or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, that's really nonsense. It's another trip. It's just another game. It's a way of putting. So, okay, here's what I would say. Meditation uh, to me shouldn't be seen as something like that you do, that you like force yourself into that you like drill into yourself and you do it like eating broccoli, like you just, you're supposed to do it. <laughs> I really think like you, it helps me to reframe it. Sometimes I call it snuggling with infinity uh, or Rupert calls it um, self-resting. Resting in yourself. So this is, this is what I would say to anybody interested. We were doing this earlier, but if you close your eyes and, and you just, witness this expanse of knowing there's there's a there's whatever you're experiencing it is known right and this is all rupert spira but it is known and it seems to be limitless we can't find a limit to it okay then what what do we do with this so this seems to be the backdrop of everything i would say this is who we really are we add on top of this knowing things like Kathy, things like Pete, things like I'm, I live in Florida, I live in Los Angeles, but all of that stuff appears in this field. It's a story that we tell and maintain and people reflect it back. I reflect it back to you when I call you Kathy. So it must be real. But when we close our eyes and see this field, here's what meditation is. We can, we can follow our breath. We witness the sensation. We let knowing know itself, right? It's like the, sh the sun illuminating itself. Does this field of knowing have a problem, right? It, is, is it lacking anything? Does it want anything? Is there anything you could add to it or take away from it? Okay, that's what meditation is, resting in that. And that's a joy. That's not just, I don't do it to be successful. And I love that he said that. I certainly don't meditate to be successful. But when I first started meditating, I wanted to sleep better. I wanted to focus better, all that stuff. Now all of that stuff has gone away. I don't do a mantra anymore. I don't even really try to follow my breath. I just try to 
sink back into the knowing. Because what Rupert would say, what he taught me, and I believe he learned this from Ramana Maharshi, if, if I asked you to stand up and take a step towards yourself, could you do it? Meaning the direct path, which is self-inquiry, you start at the destination and you stay there. Meaning you are the peace you're looking for. You are the happiness you're looking for. So stop anything. This is all Rupert, by the way, please. Rupert Spira, check him out. Anything that you're focusing your intention on, your attention, your breath, a mantra, an image, whatever, is going away. You're pointing that attention away. Try and point it back at itself. And, and that effort, it's not an effort, it's more of a rest. It's not falling asleep, it's, 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 it's a surrendering. And if you need a mantra or you need a way to get started, you say, what is it that's aware of my experience? is a good one, or am I aware is a very good one. You ask and you really investigate, you go, am I aware? And you look for it and you find it. What did you just find? Rest there. So there are people that are like, meditate twice a day for 20 minutes, it's gonna change it. Or like, or what I did earlier, when I did crashing season two, three, I was meditating for an hour every morning. Good for fucking you, dude. I'm glad. And you worked in a tapping method and you did fire breath. Great. But at a certain point, you just go like, who is it that's meditating? And what is the nature of that, of that knowing? And how can I just fucking stop? Right. <laughs> that's what it is. Fucking stop. Stop trying to be a good meditator. Stop trying to see how it affects your life. I, and I'm getting pleasure out of doing it right now. Just like ease back, lower, deeper into it because that place has no problem. It was never born. It, does, it never dies. And it's not it's intimately involved in your drama, but it is not affected by it. Rupert would say in the same way, the screen of a movie is not tainted or, or dyed or stained by the, the events in a movie. So our knowing is not affected, tainted or dyed by the drama in our life, which is always changing. Now the drama in your life is me. Well, it's not gonna be me in 10 minutes. It's always changing. So stay with that, which does not change. Some people call that God. You can also just call it yourself. That's how I would reframe meditation. <laughs> it's literally, I'm going to say it. It sounds insane. You're not going to believe me, but it, I think it's the best, most beautiful, accessible way I've ever heard it described. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Just tell everybody where they can listen to the podcast. You already mentioned how we roll. Tell them when it airs again. Did you say it was March 20th? Third? Is that what you said? 31st. 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 Um, and then you made it weird. Do we get to hear these kinds of conversations on you made it weird? We do, right? I just yeah. wanted you to let them constantly. know. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah, constantly. And I, I, I just want to say it again because I don't want anyone to think that these are my analogies and my phrasings. Uh, it's Rupert Spira is the teacher that is that has illuminated this to me. He's the one that said self-resting. I said snuggling with infinity if you want to split hairs. <laughs> My ego wants to be like, I'm special too. But please, if, if you like that stuff, um, we'll please put check links out the to it in the show notes. And everyone's going to yeah. go listen to You Made It Weird. And uh, yes, constantly talking about this stuff on that. Yeah. I don't know what the words are to use for you. I don't have any good ones uh, other than uh, I just feel so much love and joy. Um, you're just a special, special soul. So, Thanks for being you. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. This was great. I knew, I, I had a feeling. I, I looked at your show and, <laughs> and did a little research and I, I was like, I think this one's going to be fun. And I was right. So thank you, Kathy. Oh, Pete Holmes. We all love you so much. I, I just hope you continue to have so many opportunities to just take this goodness and have it multiplied in the ears of so many people because we need you. We need you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And have a great show tonight. I wish I was there. Thank you. Okay. I know, 101. Bye-bye, <laughs> okay. Thank Bye, you. Bye, honey. Bye.